Before I get into how wild and crazy this week is, I want to start out by thanking uh, all of the veterans uh, who have served our country, helping us to preserve the freedoms that so many unfortunately take for granted in our nation today. And uh, that's kind of the sanity of this week. Uh, but there's also been, uh, it's been kind of wild. Uh, earlier in the week on Tuesday morning, uh, November 8th, just before our midterm elections, uh, which are still going on three days later, uh, we had a blood moon, a, a full lunar eclipse that we could see in our area. Anybody stay up and watch? Okay, I was up there too, only there was a, just a thin band of clouds right where the moon was. Um, it was clear just past it and clear before it, but um, a lot of times it was, it was being blocked. And after November 8th, the next day was November 9th, which is the anniversary of Kristallnacht, uh, much to the dismay of KFC, who sent out uh, a thing by mistake in Germany, encouraging Germans to celebrate Kristallnacht and come and get some uh, chicken and cheese. Uh, so they're working on their comp automatically computer-generated advertising for uh, special events throughout the year because on this night uh, the shooting of a Nazi diplomat in Paris by a Jewish teenager was used as an excuse to damage or destroy 267 synagogues and seven, around 7,000 Jewish businesses. Hundreds were killed and 30,000 Jewish men were rounded up and sent to concentration camps. Our Jewish people remember this day as the first step of the final solution the Nazi plan to eliminate all Jewish people of Europe in what became the Holocaust, the slaughter of over six million Jewish men, women, and children. So let's just go to the Lord in prayer and pray uh, as our Jewish people say, uh, never again. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, Lord, we acknowledge you as King over all the universe. And Lord, we just uh, thank you that you are in charge of all that is taking place. You are able to take uh, what the enemy intends for evil and use it for good. And Lord, uh, as we uh, turn to the scriptures for direction, uh, for eternal truth, Lord, that would uh, help us to know that what we need to do in the days ahead. Lord, we pray that the events of the Holocaust would never again be repeated, uh, that this world would not allow someone that evil um, to take control. But Lord, we know, uh, as I said, that, that you are in charge. And we thank you, Lord, um, that we can just come together this evening. Uh, we can seek truth from your word. And we desire to bring glory to you in all that we do. And we ask these things in our Messiah Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. We also pray that he would give us the leaders that he wants us to have because the question of who our leaders are going to be uh, is still up in the air. And of course, we also had to, as another part of the wild week, was uh, Tropical Storm Nicole by the time it hit us. Uh, it was a Category 1 hurricane when it made landfall in Florida. But I, I'm uh, thankful that it seems like for most people, we just got... Uh, rain that we could actually use, uh, and that uh, I pray that there was no um, damage uh, caused by the storm, uh, and that the Lord watched over and protected uh, those who might be in the path of falling trees or that sort, or even I think uh, sometimes with these storms you have uh, Category 1 tornadoes as well. That's what They're called EF1s, but close enough. Anyway, um, <clears throat> So to bring us up to date, last week we discussed Torah portion Lech Lecha, uh, where Abraham uh, was told by the Lord to go into a land that the Lord would show him uh, and later entered into a covenant relationship with the Lord that was the first covenant that was established with a specific group of people uh, instead of all of humanity, as was the case uh, in the covenants with Adam and Noah. But Abraham still has a problem, right? He was having difficulty breathing. Now, why do I say that? Because he had no air. 
Um, <laughs> Go on. <laughs> made it up myself. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> then God told him that he would have an heir from his own loins, and Abraham and Sarah wrongly concluded that God intended for Abraham to have a son by Sarah's handmaid, Hagar, uh, a son who will be named Ishmael, meaning God hears. And in Genesis 16 to 12, uh, it is prophesied concerning Ishmael that he will be a wild man uh, with his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brothers. Ishmael is thought to be the ancestor of Muhammad and many of the Arab peoples. And they continue in many ways to create conflict with the children of Israel today. So uh, a prophecy all the way back in Genesis may very well still be impacting us today. And we may find uh, in this message that that's not the only one. This week's Torah portion is called Vai Era, which means, and he appeared. I'm going to say that again because I didn't pronounce it right. Vai Yera, which means, and he appeared. Because in Genesis 18, verse 1, Abraham <coughs> is sitting at the door of his tent. And it says that the Lord appears to him. The Hebrew word for the Lord in this verse are the four letters yud he vav he sometimes called the Tetragrammaton. Now, because we no longer know how to pronounce those four Hebrew letters, the Jewish people substitute the word Adonai, which is a Hebrew word that is found over 400 times in the scriptures and means my great master. In English Bibles, yud he vav he is often translated as Jehovah in the English, such as in Genesis 22, verse 14, uh, as we sang earlier, Abraham names the place where he was ready to offer up Isaac, Adonai Yireh. And in Genesis 18, verse 2, when Abraham lifts up his eyes, instead of seeing Adonai, he sees three Anashim, three men standing next to him. Though later in Genesis 19, verse 1, two of the men will be described as Malachim, messengers or angels. Abraham shows hospitality toward the men, beginning in Genesis 18, verse 4, offering them water and rest under a tree. And then he does what many men would do in this type of situation. He runs to his wife and tells her to fix some bread while he goes and gets a calf for them to eat. While the men are eating, Sarah overhears one of them saying that she will have a son. And she laughs to herself, as we read earlier. Because not only has she been barren her entire life, but now she is well past the age of childbearing. In Genesis 18, verse 14, one of the men says to Abraham, Is there a davar? Is there a word that is too difficult for Adonai? The one speaking continues, La Moed, at the appointed time, I will return to you and Sarah will have a son. By the way, earlier in Genesis 17, verse 17, Abraham also laughed at the idea of having a son by Sarah. Abraham is being told that the Lord is not limited by this world and its rules. We believe in and we serve a miracle working God. Amen? Amen? We may be limited in our power and understanding, but we can choose to trust in the one who is El Shaddai, the all powerful, all knowing, almighty God. Now, one of the adversary's primary missions is to see if he can get God's followers to doubt whether God can be trusted to fulfill his promises, to doubt whether his written revelation to us is trustworthy. For example, most Jewish people are told you can believe anything you want about God, even that he doesn't exist, and you're still considered Jewish. But if you believe that the God of the Bible sent his son Yeshua as Emmanuel, God with us, as it says in Isaiah 7 verse 14, or as the suffering servant prophesied in Isaiah 53, that's the one thing you can do that our Jewish people today consider uh, as a reason that someone can be uh, seen as no longer being Jewish. 
The adversary not only has convinced our Jewish people and confused them in that area, but he's also convinced the body of believers that are not Jewish, the, what we call the church, that God's faithfulness to the promises he's made to the Jewish people are fulfilled by giving the promises to the church, which is referred to as replacement theology. And that is why Messianic congregations are so important today. We are the ones bringing the message of the Jewishness of Yeshua as Messiah, the Jewishness of the new covenant faith to our Jewish people. Now, we don't limit it to them, but we are uniquely qualified to bring that message in a way that they can relate to, in a way that they can see the Jewish context, the Jewish culture, uh, that Yeshua, the, the family that he grew up in, uh, you know, just even the names. The world thinks, uh, and, and certainly most Jewish people think, that Jesus was born to two Catholics, right? Mary and Joseph. Um, they have no idea that it was a Jewish girl, Miriam, and a Jewish man, Yosef. And so, uh, yeah, we translate those into English as Joseph, and, and Miriam would be a better translation than, than Mary. But uh, nonetheless, we are bringing that message to our people. The adversary also has convinced our people that God cannot appear on earth in human form, even though that seems to be what we find taking place in Genesis 18. In the Jewish rite of passage called the Bar Mitzvah, a Jewish boy is said to become a man. I call this message, Did God Have a Bar Mitzvah? Because here in this passage and in several other places throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, God becomes a man. And we find this confirmed in the New Covenant Scriptures as 1 Timothy 3 verse 16 says, God was manifest in human form and taken up in glory, referring to Yeshua. The scriptures reveal Yeshua as the creator of the universe coming to, faith, uh, coming to earth in human form. But many Jewish people and others mistakenly think that Christians believe Jesus was born a man, a normal human baby, uh, and then because he was so good, because he did so many righteous acts, he became a god. But the reality is, we see a description where through in a number of places in the scriptures, they're actually called theophanies, uh, throughout the Hebrew scriptures, where God appears to men uh, in human form. And we also see by the description in, uh, in Isaiah 7.14, uh, and similarly, uh, we see something similar in Isaiah 9 as well, the idea that the... Uh, everlasting father, the, the prince of peace, would be born to a woman. And so uh, we have this idea of, of God being born uh, in human form. At the end of Genesis 18, Abraham bargains with God to see if the Lord would reverse his decision to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah based on how many righteous people are there. He starts with 50 and ends up at 10. Uh, and this is the basis for the minion, the requirement to have a quorum, to have 10 uh, adults uh, for a Jewish service. In Genesis chapter 19, as we mentioned earlier, two of the three men that Abraham saw in Genesis 18 verse 12 are now described as malachim, as messengers. Uh, or in the English, it's often translated as angels because the Greek word for messenger is angelos where we get the term angel. These two messengers go to Sodom to rescue Lot from the men of that nation. And I think that we can learn a lot from Lot uh, in terms of what not to do. You were wondering, what are we learning from Lot? What not to do because he consistently seems to make the wrong choices. Whenever he makes a decision, we can at least see if perhaps we can learn from his mistake, because I think Lot is not all that different from us. But the good news is that despite our bad decisions, despite our times of faithlessness, despite our waywardness, despite our uh, questioning of our creator, 
the Lord still offers us salvation, deliverance from the destruction that we deserve. The messengers tell Lot, along with his wife and two daughters, to leave and not look back. And we all know the story, right? Lot's wife decides to look back, and she's turned into a pillar of salt. As if that's not bad enough, Lot's daughters come up with or hatch a plan to have uh, their father um, be the father of their children, which will become the people known as the Moabites, and the Ammonites. And we will see that at times they will uh, create problems for the children of Israel uh, down the road. In Genesis 21, at the tender age of 100, Abraham finally has the promised son by Sarah. And Abraham names him Isaac. Let's all say that together. Isaac. Okay, that was easy enough. In the Hebrew, Yitzchak. Okay, now we're going to try saying that together. Yitzchak. Okay. Yeah, the ch in there. Otherwise, you sound like a South Carolina football fan. And I know there's some uh, Clemson fans out there who don't want that to be the case. So it's a completely different word. Uh, and, and it's a word that means laughter. So look at what has happened. Uh, it, they were given instructions to name him that, such that every time they call their son's name, they will be reminded that what seemed like foolishness to them was not too hard at all for the Lord, as he has fulfilled the promise that Abraham would have a son by Sarah. And when Isaac is eight days old, according to Genesis 21, verse 4, Abraham does what? Has him circumcised, right? Fulfilling the requirement of the covenant uh, that uh, God and Abraham had established. But the testing of the covenant doesn't come until after Abraham sends uh, Hagar and Ishmael away later uh, in Genesis 21. Which brings us to Genesis 22. In verses 1 and 2, the Lord instructs Abraham to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice. And I have to tell you, this concept creates a lot of problems for our Jewish people today. The idea uh, that God would ask uh, Abraham to essentially practice child sacrifice. But if we uh, kind of look at the overall picture, and it's a picture our Jewish people don't understand because this is really, uh, and, and it's described that way, as a testing of the covenant. And we're going to see how that plays out through our new covenant understanding and it all comes together for us and makes a lot more sense. Uh, Isaac, taking stock of the situation, asks his father in Genesis 2, verse 7, famous words, I see the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham responds in Genesis 22, verse 8, as we sang earlier and as it reads in the Jewish Bible I had growing up, Lift up Bible. It doesn't say that, but that's what I'm going to do anyway. Um, <clears throat> a traditional Jewish Bible. Uh, Abraham responds, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Now, it, that's actually found in the Hebrew, and it could be just that it's actually uh, what we would call in the English reflexive. Uh, but, and that's a grammatical term. But could, it could also be a clue to God literally providing himself uh, in the form of Messiah Yeshua, who in the mystery of God's triune nature uh, is his son, as Paul writes in Colossians 2 verse 9, describing Messiah uh, as the fullness, in him is the fullness of the Godhead. As Abraham draws the knife to offer up his son, the Malach Adonai, the messenger of the Lord, says to him in Genesis 22, verse 12, Don't lay your hand on the boy, for now I know that you are a man who fears God, because you have not withheld your only son from me. And then Abraham looks up and sees a ram caught in the thicket by his horns, and he offers up the ram in Isaac's place. 
the horns part is important on Rosh Hashanah because we connect this event um, to uh, the blowing of the shofar, reminding us of this event and also uh, believing that some of these uh, events may have very well have taken place on that day. While in Genesis 22 verse 15, it's the messenger of the Lord, the Ma'ach Adonai who is speaking. In Genesis 22 verses 16 through 18, it's the Lord himself. yud Hey vav Hey, those four Hebrew letters, the Tetragrammaton. Uh, and the Lord says, I have sworn by myself that because you have not withheld your only son, I will bless you and I will increase your seed to as many as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. They will possess the cities of their enemies and by your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you obeyed my order. So uh, we see this, this transition as once again, the Lord, uh, we, first we have this, um, this person, this character, uh, this entity, the Malach Adonai, the messenger of the Lord. <clears throat> and there are many um, Messianic believers and, and uh, non-Messianic believers as well who argue that that term, um, Malach Adonai is a description of the pre-incarnate Messiah Yeshua. Uh, that he, that we have these theophanies, these uh, heavenly appearances on earth before Yeshua was born. Uh, so, but in this case, we, we see that Malach Adonai become the Yud Hey Vav Hey, the creator of the universe. And we don't understand exactly how that happens, but it seems to me like um, the Jewish people have in their scriptures evidence and revelation of the triune nature of the creator of the universe, even though, you know, I mentioned before that they think Jesus' parents were, were two Catholic um, people, two Catholics, Joseph and Mary. Um, they also think that Christians believe in more than one God, and they don't. But as we see in the scriptures here, we see that God is represented in more than, than one way. And we believe that that's tied to um, his triunity being revealed. And we see that a, a number of other places. Uh, we see that in Genesis 1 verse 2 where it talks about the Ruach Elohim, the, the spirit of God. And in Isaiah 48, verse 16, where it talks about uh, his spirit and the one who existed long ago has sent me. And so um, we, we, we see clues um, throughout the scriptures, uh, the Hebrew scriptures, that would suggest uh, the mystery of the triune nature of the creator of the universe. Our new covenant portion describes Abraham's faith, his trusting in the Lord during his time of testing by the Lord. Here's what it says in Hebrews 11, verses 17 through 19, as we read earlier. By trusting, Abraham, when he was put to the test, offered up Isaac as a sacrifice. Yes, he offered up his only son, he who had received the promises, to whom it had been said, what is called your seed will be in Isaac. For he had concluded that God could even raise people from the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did so to receive him. So the writer of Hebrews wants us to see that Abraham's faith involved trusting in God to resurrect Isaac in the event that Abraham actually went through with the sacrifice. But we also saw in the Haftarah portion that there's a literal account of resurrection uh, in the Hebrew scriptures, and uh, it's not even the only one. But I would also like to say uh, something that I, I kind of hinted at earlier, which is uh, this covenant relationship between Abraham and the Lord. Because we, um, it, for the last several months, until we got to um, the High Holy Days, to the end of the High Holy Days, we were going through the book of Deuteronomy. And we described the book as being laid out in the format of a treaty of that time called a suzerainty treaty. Uh, here, Abraham and, and the Lord entered into another type of treaty of uh, the time of Abraham, and that was called a uh, covenant of strong friendship. 
And in that type of treaty, in, in the suzerainty treaty, the suzerain is superior and his subjects uh, um, uh, agree to his um, demands, his requirements, in order for him to provide protection uh, and they uh, provide uh, obedience to his instructions. But in this type of treaty, everything that one party owns becomes available to the other party, and the easiest way to test that is by a asking the other party for their most valuable possession. Abraham's commitment to the covenant was tested when the Lord asked Abraham for his most valuable possession, his son Isaac, the son he had desired for many years the son that is the child that through whom the blessing is to come, the child of his beloved wife, Sarah. Those are all reasons that Abraham won't want to go through with the sacrificing of Isaac. But trusting in the Lord is the reason that he is willing to do so. And uh, when we look at this testing of the covenant, we have to realize that when the Lord tests the covenant and asks Abraham for his most valuable possession, then the Lord has to be willing to offer up his most valuable possession as well, his son Yeshua. And although it would be several thousand years later, God would prove himself faithful to the covenant as well. Now, as was the case with Isaac, we're going to see even more parallels. A substitute was actually uh, offered up uh, in uh, place of Yeshua. In this case, it was Barabbas. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned Bar Mitzvah earlier. The literal translation of Bar Mitzvah, Bar is Aramaic for son, and Mitzvah is commandment. So we refer to, in the English, to Bar Mitzvah as son of the commandment. Well, uh, the one that was offered up as a substitute uh, when Yeshua was going to be sacrificed was named Bar Abbas. Bar meaning son once again, and Abbas is like a Greek way of saying Abba, son of the father is what his name would have meant. And he did deserve to die because he was a murderer, just as we deserve to die because of our sin, according to Yechezkel, Ezekiel 18 verse 4 and Romans 6:23. But this time the substitute was set free. Remember in Isaac's situation, Abraham looks up and sees a ram caught in a thicket and offers up the substitute. Here, Barabbas is set free. And uh, even though he had done uh, nothing wrong, the son of God was offered up in our place. Uh, our heavenly father offered up his sinless son because of his love for us. And this doesn't end the Abrahamic covenant. It's actually the final ratification of it as now the testing of the covenant by both parties has been completed. So in the, as I said earlier, we can see why the Lord would ask Abraham to do this. And we also see that the Lord had to be willing uh, to offer up his son Yeshua uh, as well. And we know that that is what is brought about forgiveness for our sins and a restored relationship with the creator of the universe. And so um, we see this testing of the covenant as a blessing to us today. Now, I also talked about um, the Haftarah, which is 2 Kings chapter 4, and it's chosen because of several similarities to the Torah portion. Uh, Abraham entertained guests in the Torah portion, and in the Haftarah, a Shunammite woman welcomes Elisha, Elisha, uh, as her guest and builds a room for him on her roof. In both portions, a Malach Adonai, a messenger of the Lord, comes to a barren woman and tells her that she will soon give birth to a son, actually. Uh, at La Moed, at the appointed time, the woman is told she will have a son. Both messages are skeptically received but both women end up giving birth to sons. And finally, both the Torah and Haftarah portions close with accounts of sons who survive what otherwise seems like a deadly experience. Isaac is to be offered up on top of Mount Moriah, 
but is saved at the last minute by the messenger of the Lord and a strategically placed ram. The Shunammite woman's son dies, but in 2 Kings 4, verses 34 and 35, as we read earlier, the child comes back to life. Uh, he is resurrected by the Lord through the prophet Elisha. Her son's resurrection reveals God supernaturally overcoming the barrier of death in the Hebrew scriptures, just as Yeshua did with Lazarus, just as God did with Yeshua. God raised Yeshua from the dead so that one day, according to Zechariah 14, he will return as Mashiach ben David, as the Messiah, son of David, uh, to deliver our Jewish people who are described as being on the verge of being wiped out by their enemies. But until that time, we seek to better understand how to live out his truths, to obey the instructions that he has written on our hearts as a testimony to our Jewish people and the rest of the world of the faithfulness of our God. In our Torah portion, we saw how the sacrifice of Isaac painted a picture for us that would lead us to un better understand the sacrifice of Yeshua. In the Haftarah, we see an account of resurrection in the Hebrew Scriptures. And our New Covenant portion reminds us that as was true for Abraham, it's all about faith. It's all about trusting in the Lord's promises. Abraham had a covenant relationship with his Creator. And through God's final covenant renewal with Abraham's descendants, described uh, by the Jewish prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 31, he has fulfilled his promise that through Abraham, all the families of the earth would be blessed. As all of us, Jew and Gentile, are able to experience forgiveness for our rebellion against the Lord's ways. All of us are able to experience a restored relationship with our Creator. Now, you may be here tonight, you may be watching on the video, and you may have made some mistakes in the past, and the adversary would have you believe that they were so bad that there's no way that God can forgive you, that you are not worthy of God's love and forgiveness. But the reality is, God's love is not based on what we do. It's based on what his son has done. He demonstrated it through the willingness to sacrifice his son. So you can know for sure that God is willing to forgive your sin, no matter how bad it seems, as you can start with a clean slate. And the first step is to receive forgiveness for sins that we've committed all our lives, but that we've never received the sacrifice that brings the cleansing. We've never accepted Yeshua's sacrifice on our behalf. So I'd like to ask with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you've never accepted Yeshua before, but now you realize that you need to accept the sacrifice that your heavenly Father, the creator of the universe, has provided for your benefit to say to, Yeshua, to the Lord, yes, I want my sins to be forgiven so that I too can have a covenant relationship with you. All you have to do is trust in him and just raise your hand as a sign that you want to do that. Is there anyone? We always give that opportunity. We never take for granted that everyone uh, has made that uh, commitment, who has accepted Yeshua's sacrifice. And if you're watching this on video and you've realized that you need to make that decision, we encourage you to uh, text us or um, call and, and let us know or, or email some way uh, to let us know or at least let somebody know uh, who may have been praying for you for a long time, as is often the case. But we rejoice every time. Yeah, actually, it says the angels, the messengers in heaven uh, rejoice whenever a uh, sinner is able to come to faith and be redeemed through the sacrifice of Messiah Yeshua. But uh, then we, what happens after we experience the, receive the gift of salvation? Well, now we are still walking in a fallen world, and we still deal with the, uh, the challenges, the, the um, fallenness of, of our flesh, the weakness of the flesh. And so, you know, perhaps there's an area where you've been trusting in your own capabilities uh, instead of the truths that the Lord has revealed to you at some point. 
Maybe you've trusted him with part of your heart. Uh, Proverbs, uh, in, in Proverbs, Solomon tells us to trust in the Lord with, with all of our heart. Or maybe like Lot, you just keep making bad decisions. Uh, I've seen numerous cases where, where we as humans uh, tend to do this. Our, our pride rises up. And instead of admitting we're wrong, we just keep uh, making the issue worth, uh, worse. But the reality is um, that you can uh, commit from this day forward to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, being led by his spirit, so that you would then be able to make better choices uh, down the road, and you might be able to serve the Lord in, in a greater way. Perhaps uh, there's just one sin that, that you've struggled with, and victory up to this point has been elusive, but you can believe the miracle-working creator of the universe who was able to provide a son for Sarah and Abraham can provide the victory for you uh, in that area where you struggle. Perhaps you need a, a healing for finances or a relationship. You can believe in a, for a miracle in that area as well or any other area that he may have revealed to you uh, that you just want to respond uh, to uh, this calling, the, this revelation that the Lord has given you. And all you really have to do, once again, is raise your hand, this time saying, I want there to be a concrete action on my part uh, that would help me to remember the decision that I am making this night and trusting, Lord, that you will help me, uh, that you will remind me, uh, and that you will give me uh, a victory uh, in an area where I may not have been able to experience victory in the past. As we say to the Lord tonight, not our will, but your will be done. As we believe that you are able to work the miracle that is needed in our nation, in our families, in our congregation, whatever the situation may be, Lord, we thank you that uh, you are not limited by the laws of our universe. And Lord, we thank you that uh, we can just say to you tonight that we desire to better understand your truths and to draw closer to you and to trust in you in a greater way from this day forward. And everyone said, amen, amen. and amen. God bless you all. Thank you all for coming.